a monk joined a monastery. He took a vow of silence. After the first 10 years, his, uh, the, the head uh, of the monastery called him in and asked, do you have anything to say? Well, he replied, food bad. Well, another 10 years went by. The monk again had the opportunity to voice his thoughts, and he said, bed hard. Another 10 years went by, and again he was called in, uh, you, know, do, you know, do you have anything to say? And he said, I quit. <laughs> to which the head of the monastery said, well, it doesn't surprise me a bit. You've done nothing but complain ever since you got here. <laughs> Listen, as humans... Grumbling and complaining is something that we all do, but according to God's word, which we're going to read today, it is something that we are not supposed to do. Grumbling and complaining is not fitting for children of the Most High God because we have everything to be joyful about. We are redeemed from sin. We are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Listen, Christian, discontentment And arguing simply leads to a destructive spirit of division within a community of believers. And it can take down a church in no time flat. In our text today, Paul commands us, and let's not forget, this is under divine authority as he wrote these letters to the churches. He commands us to put such things behind us so that we can promote unity within the church. So look at verse 12. We'll read verses 12 and 13 first just to get a sense of where Paul is going. He's still really, um, he's coming off of what he talked about last week. So he says here, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more by my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You know, Paul has just given us, as we saw last time, one of the greatest doctrinal teachings of the New Testament. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, came as a servant and washed his disciples' feet and thus commanded us to do likewise for our brothers and sisters in him. Then after shedding that shameful servant's towel, that dirty towel, after washing their feet, Jesus went out and put on the shameful, dirty, old, rugged cross and died for it, for our, died on it for our sins. But upon rising from the grave and conquering death, he is now the name above all names. And one day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. However, as those who have been uh, chosen in this present age to bend our knee and confess that he is Lord, you guys know what comes after that. It's our reasonable service, as Paul would tell the Roman church in chapter 12. It's our reasonable service to follow his example until he comes to take us home. So Paul inserts the word here in verse 12, therefore, causing us to think about all that he has taught us and get ready to put it into action. Now don't miss something here. Don't miss the connection between the obedience Jesus showed in Philippians 2 verse 8, that humbling of himself, being obedient unto death, and the obedience that Paul expects of Christians as followers of Jesus. In other words, just summing up uh, these two verses, Paul says, listen, you've heard me call you to live humbly like Christ and to look at others as more important than yourselves. Now, I'm going to begin to give you some very explicit directions on how to live this out. How to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is working in and through you for his glory and for his will to be done. So a couple of things we need to look at real fast, because this, at first glance, the work out your salvation 
It needs to be understood correctly. When he says to work out your own salvation, we must understand he is not contradicting himself. He's not contradicting the gospel of grace that he has clearly taught, that salvation is a free gift of God. No one can earn their salvation. What, what the key to understand is the word used for work out in the Greek. It doesn't speak of working for salvation but rather working through it, or really, literally, working it through. It, it carries the idea of a student working out a math problem, just like he would work through the various stages of the problem to come to a proper conclusion. So we, too, must work through the various stages of our walk with Christ, and our growth and our maturity in him. Does that make sense? So this passage doesn't tell us like, oh, you've got to earn your salvation. You've got to work for your salvation. No, it tells us that you've got to work out your salvation. Work it out. Look at all the things the Holy Spirit's trying to teach you. Walk in those. You know, if it means some conviction, you know, where do we, what are we going to do when the Holy Spirit convicts us of a particular sin? Or, you know, we've got to work that out. We need to be attentive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. This speaks powerfully of the doctrine of sanctification, not justification. Sanctif- justification is that we were saved. We, the blood of the cross saved us from our sin. That's justification. We have now been found just before a holy and just God, only through the blood of Christ, which is that free gift. However, sanctification is something that we are walking in every day. That's the lifelong process of learning to live a life that pleases God. And that's the main thrust of verse 13. It tells us God is working on us, always working in and through us to do his will, to do his good pleasure. You see, when we talk about, remember, we're we're staying in context with the whole chapter here. When we talk about the highest place that our Lord and Savior uh, has taken now that he was humbly went to the cross and then rose victorious from the grave, we must also remember that not only will we confess this one day, but we will also give an account for our conduct as followers. One day, Jesus will assess how well we washed others' feet. Remember when we read that in John 13? I, I, what did he say? I have showed you an example. Now go and do this. So we'll stand before him, and he will assess how well we did that. Christian, aren't you glad that God is indeed working in and through us for his goodwill and pleasure. Our obedience to his direction and our willingness to let him complete the work that he began in us. Remember, Paul started this book with that verse, Philippians 1.6. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Now Paul brings us all the way back to the idea that he is going to complete it. And our working out of our salvation, our obedience, our willingness to to let him have his goodwill and pleasure in us is going to happen because he is going to complete the work that he began in us. That verse in the beginning, Philippians 1.6, should be the driving force behind our conduct. And as such, it should be a sign that we are allowing him to do it. Now, here's where we're going to drill down on a little bit today. As I often will tell you, you know, I, I, I got to get Aaron to put a klaxon sound in there because this is a conviction alert passage today. <laughs> Paul gives us now a second clear command as to what is crucial to our obedience and our working out of our salvation. 
Verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. We'll just hold right there for a second. Let that verse just descend upon all of our hearts. As we got here this morning, no matter whatever was happening this morning, you know, I was complaining right off the bat. Got some donuts yesterday at the Grand Central Market, peanut butter and jelly donut. And my wife said, you know, was it good? And I'm like, well, I can only eat half of it because it's too sweet. But I'm like, it was okay. But the peanut butter was whipped. I was not expecting that. So here I was complaining right off the bat. <laughs> you guys, this verse, because I read early in the week, I kind of get an idea of the text we're going through, and oh, these are, these are those verses that I have to deal with all week long. You get it on Sunday, so you'll get to deal with it all week long now, but I had to deal with it all week coming into Sunday, watching and trying to re- catch myself. Do all things. Does it say some things or pick and choose what things you'd like to do without complaining and the rest, it's like, you know, I'm going to just say my mind. No, do all things without complaining and disputing. (laughs) There it is. We're to do everything without complaining or grumbling or disputing or more precisely uh, what in the Greek what Paul says, do all things without complaining and arguing. Now, Many see a strong allusion here to the children of Israel after the exodus and during their time in the wilderness. God had rescued them from Egypt. They had seen great and wondrous works. And now uh, as they were uh, there gathered after they'd come through the Red Sea, he's, he's come down and he's brought his covenant to them. He's shown up in great power and glory and, and he's trying to work out, and that's the whole point of him calling out the nation of Israel. When he began with Abraham and then over 400 years later called the Hebrews, his people, out of all the tribes, God's been working out his goodwill and pleasure Think about it in people who just grumbled and complained and fought and argued and threw their brother in a pit and all this stuff. God's still working out his goodwill and his pleasure to bring about what? His goodwill towards all mankind. To bring about a chosen people that would be fit to bring the Messiah into the world so that we might all be saved from our sin. But during that time, especially in the, in the wilderness, you know, it's funny too, because we always talk about Israel in the wilderness. If they would have been obedient from the beginning, there would be no Israel in the wilderness. It would have been Israel in the promised land. What should have took three days, took 40 years. Why? Because of grumbling and complaining. Human nature took over and much grumbling and complaining became a major stumbling block. And quite frankly, as we read the New Testament, where Paul says, you know, all these things were for an example for us to not follow. It was a major identifier for them as wandering children of Israel. The Apostle Paul here aims to make sure that that does not happen to us as followers of Christ. Now again, this might sting a little bit, but we really need to stop and contemplate what we are being taught here. Critical, complaining spirits are all around us in this present evil world. Have you watched the news? Have you seen the, the news? I mean, it's news, right? It's, it's breaking news. Everybody's complaining about this and that. You know, we got an election coming up next year. Rest assured, the grumbling and complaining is going to get worse and worse. Christmas is going to be fun this year for many families. There's a lot of complaining spirits around us in this present evil world. But critical, complaining spirits have no place in the church. No place at all. These are the types of attitudes. These types of attitudes 
are why so many Christians today, listen, so, this is why so many today routinely leave their churches to go find other churches that are more to their liking. As we read Paul uh, here, and if we're reading him correctly in context, which I believe we are, we need to understand that God is trying to do something here. Here, as in the church itself, the universal and the church in San Pedro. <laughs> we should understand that he's trying to mature and grow us. And we are to do all things without grumbling and without complaining. This should be the constant state of our souls and of our lives as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling or literally with awe and reverence, standing before a holy God and, and, and giving him glory, recognizing the great place that we now have in Christ Jesus, that we don't take that lightly, we don't take it flippantly, we have been redeemed from the curse. We are headed towards an eternal uh, existence with him. We get pieces of that now. We have his spirit now who resides and dwells with us, guiding and directing us. We need to stand in awe of that. And we need to realize that God didn't just say, you know, like a fairy godmother and just go, boop, you're saved. And just go and do whatever you want and live the way. You know, one of the worst things Christians can ever say is, you know, oh, I'm not, God's not finished with me yet. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Your sin's been forgiven. And Paul says, live it out. Walk it out. Work it out. It's been done on your behalf. There's no reason to complain. There's no reason uh, to follow the route that the world is following. Those who persist in attitudes of complaining and murmuring are not obedient to Christ and to his gospel and to God. Thus they show that they are rejecting the divine commands that are given here. I like how Spurgeon talks about that word murmuring. He, he says, thanks for that book, by the way, Peter. Got some good quotes out of that. Some good organized quotes from Spurgeon on different subjects. And he's, he, he's so funny because he says murmur. Just the sound murmur sounds like a baby. Murmur, murmur. <laughs> he's like, it just sounds like a baby. It sounds like a child. Those who persist with attitudes of murmuring and complaining are not obedient to Christ. Simply put, they're not obedient to Christ. They're not obedient to the gospel. They're not obedient to God as he's commanded us uh, to live out and work out these things. Those who continue in these patterns simply impede their own souls from growth, stumble other souls of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And also, something that we often fail to remember is that those who persist in these patterns will stand before the Lord one day with fear and trembling as they will answer to him with great shame for failure in that area. And that should drive you. And that's really the, the, the gist of what Paul's trying to say. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you will stand before him one day. Now our sins have been forgiven. No one's going to stand before Christ uh, at the Bema seat there to get our rewards. And see, we often forget that along with the rewards also comes the wood, hay, and stubble that gets burned up. You don't think you're going to be shaken a little bit when all your works since you became a Christian are laid up? I, I think we'll all be a little nervous. I think there'll probably be a little fear and trembling, and then, quite frankly, there'll be some tears that, on those days too. And thankfully, the Lord's going to wipe away every tear when we enter into heaven. But I always believe that some of those tears are going to be for the lost opportunities, for the failed opportunities. We're going to realize how much we squandered away what God gave us and the power that he gave us to do these things. What Paul is trying to do here is guide the New Testament church 
as a people in a new exodus. People who have now been delivered from spiritual Egypt by the blood of Jesus Christ, who was our Passover lamb. And as such, we are on our way home to heaven, to the ultimate promised land. He wants us to get it right and not stumble and grumble and complain in a wilderness style of Christianity. We have not been called to be in the wilderness, aimlessly wandering, waiting for the promised land. We have been called to be a people of great faith, a people of great unity, a people filled with the Spirit. I mean, the children of Israel weren't filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God was in front of them and behind them and they had to look to him and they had to be active in their faith as well. But we have a new revelation. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We are not to be in the wilderness mode as redeemed saints and children of God. My friends, we can do better than this. We have a lot to be joyful and thankful for. Again, Spurgeon said, 10 minutes praying is better than a year's murmuring. As long as a man is alive and out of hell, he cannot have any cause to complain. Mark, Mark Twain said this. I love this quote. Don't complain and talk about all your problems. 80% of people don't care. The other 20% think that you deserve them. <laughs> I remember I, I used to counsel a, a gal when I was uh, on staff up at Oxnard and I was part of the evangelism team and there was a gal that used to come in all the time and um, you know, she needed a lot of counsel. She had a lot of issues with family and she, her, her, her main thrust was, you know, that they're just, you know, I know what they're thinking about me. I know they're talking about me. And I just remember telling her one day, you know, I was like, you know, people don't think about you as much as you think they do because we're all selfish and I don't spend my life walking around wondering what you're doing. I've got my, you know, Jesus said sufficient for today is its own trouble. I'm, you know, so stop thinking that people are so consumed about thinking about you all the time. They're thinking about themselves and that really kind of helped her and she repeated it to me like a couple of times after that. I just love that. Don't complain or talk about your problems because 80% of people don't care, but the other 20% think that you deserve them. That's because you tell them. So let's read the whole thing in context now. We'll, we'll do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And rather than grumbling and complaining, we're to be light. In the midst of a cro crooked and twisted generation, that's what that means, twisted, perverse, we are not to be just as twisted and perverse. Nor are we to be hiding in the dark, just waiting for Jesus to come and get us out of here. But we are to be shining as light. Amy, I love your excitement when you are just sharing. It's like, it's, it's inspiring. And we need to be joyful, even though in the midst of all the pain that you see and these people that come. And no doubt the enemy would want to just have you quit and just be so much pain and sorrow, but the joy. What a fitting uh, example as we look at a book that's supposed to be about joy and not complaining and grumbling. And we're not supposed to just hide and say, it's just so bad. It's just so bad. Jesus, just come and take us out. Jesus is like, I will. I told you I would. If I go to prepare a place for you, you know, I will come again and take you so that where I am you will be also, but occupy until I come. I've given you the Holy Spirit. Go and shine a light. Hold fast, as Paul says, to the word of life. Be a refuge for those who want to come out of the darkness and into the light. In other words, we are to be an example to this world. 
When a non-Christian observes a professing Christian to be argumentative and complaining and hard to get along with and always looking out for their own interests and a host of other ungodly behaviors, that we have a problem. They will inevitably form a very low opinion of Christianity and a very low opinion of Jesus who is trying to save them. This is even worse when a non-Christian comes into a church that is filled with professing Christians who are acting this way and motivated by a carnal spirit and a carnal attitude rather than of Christ. And the result is that they will simply not see anything different in Christians. And therefore, why would they want to be one? Verse 16 is really important in light of all of this. Paul is urging the Philippians to hold forth the word of life or specifically to stand firm on the word of God, which is our life. While he knows he may be going to be with the Lord very soon, he is still looking forward to the day when the Lord raptures his church and all the believers join him and he stands there at the reward seat, the day of Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. And as that day of rewards come, Paul wants the Philippians to know that he wants to rejoice on that day, knowing that they were obedient to the word of life and that his life and ministry had not been in vain. Remember, Paul was a living example, albeit to be poured out completely unto death. Verses 17 and 18 cover that. We'll, we'll, we'll look at those again next week with a little bit of time. But he's about to be poured out. But he was a living example of not only the humility of Christ, but of standing firm on the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the Philippians could not look at the life of Paul and say, oh, what a hypocrite he was. Or, you know, he didn't really practice what he preached because he's sitting in prison, crying and whining and desperately trying to get out. You know, jailhouse Jesus, just, you know, get along to get along and get out, hopefully get probation and get out soon. No, he was, he was in it all the way. And he knew his death was looming if uh, Nero, Nero didn't take his appeal and change his mind. Christian, there's a very powerful lesson for us here as we get ready to wrap. Standing firm on the word of God, holding forth the word of life in the sense that we are offering it to others to come so that they might know Christ. That should be the very core of who we are in the Lord. In other words, our walk comes before our talk. When people see us truly living out the life of God's word without hypocrisy, without compromise, they will listen to what we have to say. Our lives should be just as attractive to the world as the life of Jesus was attractive when he walked on this earth. Think about all the people that came to Jesus. As far as the gospel accounts go, the only people that, that grumbled and complained and didn't want anything to do with Jesus were the religious leaders and the politicians and whatnot. But they didn't, you know, Pilate was a very latecomer and he washed his hands of it anyway. He didn't want to be involved. But people gravitated towards Jesus he would go to a tax collector's house and people were fascinated by him and the result was they came to faith in him and became disciples. That's how attractive we should be as Christians. <clears throat> Sinners were eager to listen to him and come out of darkness. I'll end with a few questions for us to consider as we go forth today catching ourselves for every grumble and complaint. Do people around us see the glorious light of Christ shining or do they see some kind of shimmer like a mysterious mirage that's there one minute and gone the next? Have you ever seen a mirage in the desert? It's like you think, oh, you know, mirages are kind of cool when you're driving on the highway and you see it in the heat and it's like, oh, is it water up there? But then it's gone. We should not be a mirage. We should be a light that shines continually. Or worse yet, 
when people do come around, do they reach for their umbrellas because all they see is dark clouds of grumbling beginning to form? Do the people out there see us as those who love the Lord with awe and reverence, fear and trembling, working hard on living out and working out our salvation and representing Him well? These are good questions to ask ourselves as we strive to live with less grumble and more gospel because that's what we've been called to do. Let's stand. Next week we'll see Paul's final example and we'll see two others that he points out as really living out the faith. Read ahead if you want. Our benediction this morning. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you remind us And our call is, and what we're so blessed to have relationship with you and salvation in you. I pray that you would uh, just work in the hearts that need to be worked in, Lord. I know what I'm doing this size, you know, nothing specific today, just your word and where we are as we traverse through your word as a church, Lord. You perhaps foresee the future and know that there's going to be, you know, a move of the enemy sometimes. And we just need these a word like this to get into us now, to get habits formed now of not grumbling and complaining, Lord. So do a great work in your church. And Lord, I just want to reiterate the prayer that I had when uh, Amy was talking, Lord. Start giving dreams and visions to people in this city that they would be led to this place to experience the gospel and come to faith. Praise you and we thank you.